Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Tamina Watson, your host of Tamina Talks Immigration. Welcome. This summer, I decided to record a series called Legal Heroes in the Trump Era. I wanted to speak with some of the lawyers who have stepped up beyond their day jobs to make a difference in immigration, civil rights, and much more. I wanted their insights from their work in the last four years so we can learn lessons to take into the future, especially as one of the most consequential elections in America lies ahead. The interview series became a book called Legal Heroes in the Trump Era, Be Inspired, Expand Your Impact, Change the World. The book can be found on Amazon and other outlets. I hope you will pick it up. Enjoy these interviews. I hope you'll learn a lot. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for being here. Welcome everyone. This is Tamina Watson on Tamina Talks Immigration. And today I have a wonderful guest that I cannot wait for you to learn about. Her name is Shelley Garzone. She is a partner at Favros Law, where she practices medical malpractice law, but she's also a volunteer pro bono attorney with Widen, Washington Immigrant Defense Network, the nonprofit that I founded with some co-founders. Welcome, Shelley. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Well, you know, you have done so much for Widen, and I cannot wait to dive into all of that. But before we do that, I want the listeners and viewers to get to know you a little bit. Uh, will you tell us where you were born and where you grew up? Yeah, um, I was born in upstate New York. Actually, my dad was in medical school, and so we moved around a little bit, um, stayed in Michigan for a little bit. And then when I was eight years old, we moved to Washington. And I grew up in a small town, um, Kelso, Washington, lived there until college. And then I've lived in the Tacoma area since uh, finishing law school. Oh, wow. And, you know, that's an up and coming area. You know, it's, uh, it's actually looking so much better than it has. And it feels very trendy. So what a lovely place <laughs> to, to live. Um, you know, did you always want to be a lawyer? <clears throat> No, I was an anthropology major and um, graduate. I was always told, well, do what you love and the jobs will follow. And so I did what I loved and there's no jobs in anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, sort of did various things for a little while, worked with uh, people with developmental disabilities and um, ended up applying, taking the LSAT and applying to law school. And it was kind of an afterthought. Um, I needed something that I would graduate with a job opportunity at the end more than on anthropology. So that's how I ended up in law. Oh, how interesting. And then, uh, you know, you are a very accomplished lawyer for somebody who had an afterthought. Uh, tell us a little <laughs> bit about your legal career up to today. Yeah. Um, after I graduated, I clerked for Judge David Armstrong in the Court of Appeals Division II in Tacoma for two years. And then I had a real short stint at the Attorney General's office before I got my um, current job. Uh, when I first started, the firm was Williams Kastner and I was doing medical malpractice defense. And maybe about six years ago, um, our healthcare practice group um, left and merged with another firm. So now, Favros Law does only healthcare and um, medical malpractice type work um, rather than the whole spectrum. And so that's what I've done for most of my career. Well, you know, now that you mentioned that, I think about COVID-19 and the current, you know, life that we are living. And I imagine that you're very busy. Yeah, I am uh, mostly busy staying out of my clients' way so that they can all <laughs> do what they need to do and not worry about litigation. Um, but yeah, it's been a wild ride for my clients between first, uh, you know, preparing for this the surge, trying to understand what was going on, and then now on the back end having. Uh, healthcare providers have lost a lot of money um, as they haven't, as everybody else has, all other businesses at, with not being able to do elective procedures and such. And so it's been a very wild roller coaster for them. 
How interesting, unprecedented, you know, we're dealing with yeah. unprecedented levels of disruption and issues in every legal area, frankly, you know, yes. uh, but I hadn't necessarily thought about your day to day, because you just make everything look easy and just still donate time to widen. So <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for that. And, and so coming back to what I really want to talk about, although maybe you come back another time to talk about COVID-19 issues and legal challenges and how you lawyer them basically. Uh, but y November 2016 was a momentous time for all of us. And it sparked, um, you know, a desire to help community uh, in many ways than we would have thought. And that election night is really what the moment was for us. And where were you? You likely remember. Tell us what was going through your mind. Um. You know, I think probably like a lot of people, disbelief um, as things were developing um, and horror and fear. And, you know, I remember, I think I spent the evening and night thinking, what am I going to tell my kids tomorrow about this country and who we are and how this could happen? And, you know, kind of went from there. And so uh, you were already thinking about what's going to happen to the country and then came the travel ban. And of course, you know, there was fury and fear and all sorts of things that happened with that. What was happening through your mind during those challenges? You, you know, why didn't happen a year later, um, but things were bubbling. Explain a little bit about your the state of mind. Yeah, the travel ban um, was shocking and disturbing to me, and and I was one of the people who ran up to the airport and tried to help, um, but it was, you know, everything was so chaotic, nobody knew what was going on, uh, that I wasn't really able to find anything that I could do directly other than being there and, I guess, bearing witness to some of it, and, and from then on, um, I was looking around, feeling inadequate, um, trying to, you know, seeing definite problems and concerns and needs in the area of immigration. Uh, but everything I saw was saying, do not dabble in immigration. It's very complex. You need to have a mentor. Um, you can cause more problems than you help. So I felt really lost and wanting desperately to help, but also not wanting to bother anybody who was really busy working on it already. Um, I did call around to a variety of different, um, you know, pro bono places to try to work and got a lot of like, yes, you're right, you should not dabble in this. And yes, we're too busy to train somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. So thanks, but no thanks. Um, so that was kind of leading up to it. So Wyden, I feel like, was kind of custom made for exactly what I was looking for. So I, I actually remember as the um, family separation nightmare was starting to happen and news was coming out about it, just feeling like I couldn't even bear, like physically almost couldn't bear to not be doing anything and just scrolling through social media and the news and trying to understand what was happening and what on earth I could do, if anything, when your text popped up or your post popped up on social media as, hey, I'm tossing this around. Does anybody want to help? And, and I thought, I don't know what I'm getting into, but yeah, sign me up. <laughs> and thank you so much for doing that. You are volunteer number one, team number one, and you really gave vision to this program. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the things that I want to address is, and you know, you and I were part of this lawyer group, and you were not the only one who was really feeling that way. And did you speak to other people who were sort of feeling in the similarly to you? Yeah, I think um, amongst my friend group, um, people were feeling like we have 
time and education to give, but no real skills in the area that we need to give it was part of it. And another part of it is just there were so many areas of rights being trampled on. Where do you start? Um, and I was seeing a lot on social media as well of people going, what do we do? Um, let's just start trying to organize. And there were a number of different groups that popped up some that we were talking about before we got on here, Lawyers for Good Government, Lawyer Moms of America, some um, really great groups that had lots of opportunities. And, you know, you didn't really know what was going to bubble up to the surface as where you could provide meaningful help. Yeah, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because I think, you know, the separation of parents was, um, as that surfaced, I think not only are we lawyers, but we are mothers. And I think that instinct really shook us as, as a group. And I think I could see not only for the past year was that desire to help immigrants um, bubbling up. It was the nail in the coffin was separating little babies from their parents, from yeah. their mother. And, I, you know, and I think that's really when you know, you and I came together. But, you know, people don't necessarily know this, or maybe I have said it, I don't even know who I say it to say things to anymore. But it took 18 months for this vision to come together. And it didn't come very easily. But I could see clearly that there were, there were people like yourself, who were readily and willing to help if they had some training. And I had people who said, I can't train. And so it really, it really did come. And I love the word that you use custom made for you because I didn't know that yet, but <laughs> it really, it really did fill a gap. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about uh, what you had done for the cases and how it worked for you and why it continues to work despite your incredibly busy schedule. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, the very first case was a family separation case and um, I got the case and had never done anything at all ever in immigration law. Um, actually, even before I got the case, you had put on, Wyden put on a couple of trainings, which were really excellent and provided a lot of resources. And so I was just madly reading everything I could possibly read to try to at least have a basic understanding of how things worked so that I could have an intelligent conversation once I did get a case. Um, and then we got that first case. It was exciting um, and scary. Um, I had an excellent mentor um, who led us through and kind of, uh, she ended up being the perfect mentor because she would talk a lot about the emotional side of things and, and how to deal with that as well as the legal side of things. And so I just, uh, it was a bond hearing that we needed to do and so I helped by just jumping in and asking questions about what I could do, trying to do as much as I possibly could on my own, and essentially being a really good paralegal or associate to the lead immigration attorney, Lourdes, who um, I was, my main goal was to make her life easier. Um, a lot of what I did in that case was make calls and try to find resources and put together this bond packet. And I had not expected that side of the case that as I was making calls to people to ask for help, people were so not only willing, but grateful to have a way to help. I think in the same way that I was, people had been desperate for what can I do I want to help. And if when there was the opportunity presented to help just one family, one woman and her son, people were grateful. I mean, people were thanking me for being able to give airline miles and set up food donations and, you know, find a, a, another lawyer for them and all this kind of stuff. So um, I, I was joking that I think I cried every day for two weeks and sometimes it was about how sad the situation was and sometimes it was about how amazingly beautiful the community support and um, people's generosity was. Wow, uh, beautifully said and 
you know, I really do think there, there was that time and it's continued to grow that people really have been just looking for a way to help. And I'm so glad that you were able to do that for them. One of the questions I have for you is your legal skills were incredibly important. What we couldn't train you on is really how to be a lawyer. You know, we could train you on the substantive, you know, material, but the lawyering and the skills and how to deal with a client, those are things that you already had, you know, and that's the beauty of this program. But one of the things that, you know, looking back, and maybe it was funny at the time, but not quite, is court procedure is different in immigration yes. court. So tell us a little bit about what your experience was of all the hard work you did and had to redo. Yeah. Yeah. So everything from, oh, you printed all the stuff out on white paper, but it needs to go on blue paper if it's going to ice and green paper if it's going somewhere else or something like that to where you put the staple to we finally got our big um, bond packet together and I knew I needed to make uh, some number of copies. And so I came into the office on a Sunday because I didn't want to ask my legal assistant to do this. So I'm doing all the copying made it all beautiful, put it in the notebooks, three hole punched it, um, presented this all and Lorda says, oh, you can't, they can't be three hole punched on the side. They need to be two hole punched on the top with this and that. <laughs> and it's gonna get rejected if we have the hole punches. And for me, from coming from the civil court world, that was incomprehensible. I mean, that kind of, um, looking for any excuse to create hardship for the immigrants who are trying to just get some justice it was was mind-boggling to me i mean obviously there is nothing wrong with paper that has hole punches on the side and then you put it on the top uh if that's how they want it but we were concerned enough about it getting rejected if it had holes on both sides that i redid the whole thing so that it was funny, but it was also just so um, disturbing and heart-wrenching that if you are an immigrant who speaks a different language, who's never been in court before, and you're trying to navigate this, and someone sees, you know, it clipped with the wrong color binder or holes in the wrong places and doesn't even read the substance of your materials, what an just irrationally terrible challenge that it hurdles that it's set up for people so it was you know we had a good laugh over it but it, but the underlying what it showed was just so painful yeah and i'm so glad that you're able to articulate it that way uh one of our guests for this series has written a play about what happens in uh, an immigration courtroom and one of the things that she said is the outside folks just don't have any idea what happens inside an immigration court. So not only are you helping these immigrants, you are bearing witness to the ridiculousness that immigration court is. And there was an immigration judge who said that you are trying death penalty cases in a traffic court. Yeah. You know, and it really is like that. And you know, what is also very interesting about what you've said is you are a partner in a big law firm doing all these very complicated cases. Yet you were, you, you took it upon yourself to make sure you did the copying and not getting your legal assistant to do it. And thank you so much for stepping up to do this, because this is, this is exactly how communities come together and, and use their skills as, as necessary. But you didn't quite stop there. So you got a client out. And then, you know, a lot of people would have said, okay, I've done my part. I've done one case, but you kept going. Tell us a little bit more about some of the cases that you've done, but also why. Yeah. So I've had a couple more cases. Um, they now have been to the point where we're um, having the hearing, the deportation hearing. And um, in each time, uh, the mentor was able to divide up the work so that um, generally the mentor, the lead attorney, the immigration attorney was doing most of the client interviews and that side of the case where, and then the two, me and the other, volunteer non-immigration attorney were doing the briefing, finding the expert, um, doing some of those legwork that didn't need quite as much of the immigration experience. And for me, the language, I don't speak Spanish. And so that's been a challenge for me too. Um, so in my um, couple of cases, my 
main job was finding a country conditions expert and putting together a packet of materials about country conditions and highlighting it and briefing that. And that was very challenging because you're asking, trying to find the right person, uh, which is how you do that is kind of hard. And then you're asking them to do some work for free. And um, with my first one that I did, I didn't realize that they needed to not only prepare a declaration, but also be ready to testify, which I didn't realize until the night before the hearing. So we had some scrambling and a very, very gracious expert who agreed to be available. Um, so, you know, big learning curve there. But so it's been really great because, you know, in my day job, I know how to find experts. I know how to draft expert declarations. Um, Isla and others have really great resources. So I was able to model and copy and mostly stay out of the way of the lead immigration the attorney, um, check back in sometimes and say, make sure that I'm getting, are these the elements we need to prove? Is there anything else you need? Do you, it, does this look like okay for a draft? So it was, it was really good. Uh, I was able to feel like I could contribute in a way and really reduce their workload, um, do something meaningful and really help out. Um, and I also made a great connection with this country conditions expert who agreed to do it um, for me on two cases and has been open to more if we need her. And as we were, you know, talking about things and bonding over things, she became a bit of a friend as well. So that was a nice side benefit. That's wonderful. So that was your second case. You, you had in total how many? That was my second and third case. They were both uh, quite similar, um, both of them people from Cuba. And so the country conditions were the same, the expert could be the same. And then I had one that I was prepared to help on, but that person ended up not needing counsel. So just the three. And so question for you, from what you've observed, I mean, one of the reasons this nonprofit was set up is these people would not have had any representation. Would you agree that if you didn't step in, they would have been able to find representation, do you think? No. I mean, one, another, I, I had my eyes opened a lot going to the detention center and going to immigration court um, in how the proceedings are, how everything's locked down, how it is not open court. Um, and uh, one of the things is that there, the, the docket essentially is hanging up, posted, and Every time I've been there, there's been maybe 20 cases set for that day, and there's maybe, you know, three or four of them have lawyers, and which is stunning. Um, I did get to sit in the courtroom on one occasion. Usually they kick you out if it's not your case, but on one occasion I was able to sit there while some other people had their hearings held, and every single one who didn't have a lawyer lost. And I think it was partly because they were confused. Um, they don't have anybody guiding them through the elements that they need to prove. They don't have anyone helping them gather their evidence, even though sometimes they had evidence, but they didn't, weren't able to present it in a way that the judge would accept it. So yeah, the odds are extremely stacked against anybody with or without a lawyer, but very close to impossible, I think, without one. Yeah. Well, again, you've borne witness to something that a lot of people don't have an opportunity to see. And I'm so glad that you were able to share that. You know, what you have done is truly impressive. And I know you probably don't think that. You're just saying, I'm just using my legal skills. Would you call yourself an activist, a legal activist? I... Um... I don't think of it that way. I think of it as as volunteerism, I guess, and and compassion, maybe compassionate activism. I mean, it it's um, I guess it is. It feels different. It feels much more individualized than to me. Activism seems more society wide, mm -hmm. um, but it is it is definitely. Um, supporting human rights, I think, and um, giving back and 
and volunteering. I mean, volunteering has always been really important to me and, and that's sort of how I see it. And so one of the things that I, 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 and I, I've seen and I would love your take on it is in the Trump era, lawyers have stepped up in ways that they haven't necessarily. And, you know, some of us have created pathways and some of us have done the work. And, but all of us have come out of our just our desk job every day. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, it seems like lawyers is, are really important in the Trump era because rights are being trampled on left and right. And, and you know, when you, when you talk about activism, the way I think about activism, and maybe this is wrong, this is just my own opinion, is, uh, is changing things and getting new things um, put into place. Whereas the, the legal stuff that needs to happen right now is just enforcing what we even have and getting correct and accurate interpretations of what we have and protecting the rights that we have as humans and as Americans. And I think that is um, under attack in this administration and also in this kind of climate almost in America right now in a way that at least in my lifetime, I don't remember it ever having been. Um, so it, it does seem like lawyers find ourselves more important than we might usually think we are. <laughs> well, I think we're important. And, you know, there are a lot of lawyers who might be listening to this or watching this video who'd be thinking about what can I do? What, what more can I do? Or what could I do that's not in my day-to-day -day job and, you know, do exactly what you, you have been doing? What good guidance would you give to somebody who's looking to do a little bit more? I would just say, just do it. Um, I think Wyden is a really excellent model. And I don't know if there are similar models in other areas. I mean, there's, there are so many different area, problematic areas that need help, you know, from climate to human rights, to voting, to journalism in the free press and everything, women's rights and just, I mean, you can't even list them all. There are so many. So, and it's overwhelming. And so for me, at least, it was helpful to pick something that is close to your heart and see if you can find a way where you can use your legal skills and just jump into it. And I mean, I had no idea what I was doing um, when I was wanting to use my law degree to help I was thinking, I do healthcare defense. I am the tiniest little niche. I don't have any skills. I don't speak Spanish. I don't speak another language. I don't have any skills that anybody's going to be interested in. But as you were talking about, you have some basic skills as a lawyer. You know how to research. You know how to write. You know how to be organized. You know how to uh, work with clients. You know how to meet deadlines. Um, you know how to have respect for the court and to work within that court system. And you can apply that in a lot of different ways. And maybe in some areas like immigration, you need a guide and Wyden gives you a really great guide. Well, thank you for sharing that. I do think a lot of people uh, get stuck on, well, what can I do? And I think you're emphasizing that just pick something. Yeah. Just pick something that speaks to you and just go for it because there's no shortage yes. of issues at this point. And who knows where, you know, this country will be after November, 2020. Yeah. And, and in either situation, whichever the election, whichever direction the election goes in, lawyers are gonna continue to be important. And I do think we've got to build on this momentum and make sure that we have people in place. Shelley, thank you so much for being part of Widen and giving it life because up until you came along, it was just charts and diagrams and thoughts and the belief that it would work, but you made it, you know, you, your team and all the other volunteers. And you were one of um, eight to 10 people who stepped up that day when I said, I don't know what I'm doing either, but I know it should, we should try it. And so I will forever be grateful for that and for you to continue to take time out of your busy day as a partner in a very challenging area of law 
and you continue to help people and you've helped every single person that you help is one more person that got their life saved or assistance that they wouldn't have gotten. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And I hope that people get inspired by what you've said. And, you know, if they really want to speak with you in the future, would you be willing to talk to somebody? Yeah, of course. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Shelly, I'm going to let you go. But thank you so much for being part of this podcast, this video, and all the things that will flow from this. And take care. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. creating Widen. Thank you. Tamina Talks is brought to you by Watson Immigration Law. Founded in 2009, Watson Immigration Law is one of Seattle's premier immigration firms, specializing in business and investment visas, but offering a wide range of immigration services. If you need assistance with your immigration needs, Watson Immigration Law is ready to help. Just call 206-292-5237 to schedule an appointment. Mention this podcast to receive a 10% discount off your initial consultation fee.